I'm at the uh, tail end of some school and I'm working on a, a dissertation and I've been doing a lot of, lot of studying and one of, the, one of the things that I came across uh, this week in, in my studying is a, um, uh, a Jewish, I don't know if you want to say a blessing, but prayer uh, that uh, to this day uh, uh, Jews pray throughout the day, especially Orthodox Jews and, and Jesus it was established in Jesus' time. It's probably what Paul meant when he says, I pray without ceasing. And what they do is they, they go through their, their day, and there's a standard line that starts out, um, uh, Blessed uh, are thou, uh, Lord our God, King of the universe. And then you, you, you fill it in. And, and there's things like every morning when you get dressed, you, know, you say, Blessed are you, um, Lord our God, King of the universe, uh, who clothes the naked. And, and there's some standard ones. And then just as you go out, as you see things, it's been really encouraging me. But I just want to say, um, blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who gifted the artisans and the musicians to bless us and bring us before your throne. Amen? Amen. 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 Um, well, I, I don't know if, uh, if this is your personality, but... Every once in a while I have this, ex this experience where someone is, is talking and they're sharing. It could be a, a story or something that's going on. And something comes up in my mind. I get really excited about what they're saying. And I just can't, I can't wait to participate in the conversation. You know, you're just kind of anxious. And whether it's that person or everybody else is talking, you're just kind of waiting for it to, to die down because you want to give either your insight or, or your story or, 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 or anything like that. Hey, just so you know, I don't really care if he's that loud. I'm just going to assume that it's praise to the Lord. So you don't have to worry about it. You don't have to worry about it. Um, anyhow, I got four kids at home. It ain't nothing. So um, I, I... Man, see, now I lost my train of thought. That was my fault, not, not yours. That was my fault. What, were we talk, what was I talking about, you guys? Yes, thank you. Yes. <laughs> That's right. I want to interject in the conversation. It got me in trouble. All right. So this happened to me last week. All right. It happened to me last week in that um, when Avery uh, was teaching, the Lord uh, really blessed me. And, and I just want to publicly commend you, uh, uh, Avery, in front of everyone. That was... That was, a, that was a gift, and, and I'm not commending you because, you know, you prepared well, and it was, it was great exegesis, meaning study of, of what the scripture says, and, and great delivery, though it, it had all that kind of stuff, but uh, I really felt the Lord used it. There, there was something powerful beyond you in it, and, and uh, um, it, was, it was a huge blessing, Amen. and so hopefully, I, I think some of you might find, man, that kind of really fits together. It wasn't necessarily our attention from the beginning. But, um, but at, in the, right in the middle, he wasn't even done, but right in the middle as Avery was sharing, I just, the Lord began to stir something into me. And, and um, we didn't plan this, but we're actually, we're, I was already planning on going to First Peter uh, during the beginning of part of the, of the year. And so God just kind of used Avery to, um, um, to lay the foundation. So what I'd like you to do is, is Avery, if you, if you didn't miss it, or if you, if you missed it, you can watch it online. You can go uh, uh, to our website and just look up the, the teaching, and um, it's, the, it's the latest one. You can listen to it. It is a blessing. But uh, just to kind of give you a really quick capsulation, we'll got to get into some of the details. It was, about, it, was out about, it was in 1 Peter 5, but he reflected back on Peter and um, in his experience of walking on the water and letting go and how important it is for us really to trust, trust God. And so I want to revisit that. So if you'll turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 14. If, if you don't have a Bible, that's fine. You, can, you have a couple options. You can just trust me, which is dangerous, but you can do that. Or you can grab a, a Bible in, in front of you out of the chair. And, and if you do grab one of those Bibles, it's page 692. We're in page 692, one of those the Bibles. Now, this, um, this was a letter written by one of Jesus' 12 disciples. His name was Matthew. Matthew was a tax collector um, and... And as much as you might not like that in today's context, it was like 100 times worse in Jesus' context. Because if you were collecting taxes, you were collecting taxes for an occupying force. Okay? 
Think how the Palestinians would feel if one of their Palestinian brothers was collecting taxes for the Jews. Okay? Or, or you know, if, if you, we were, part of us was conquered and, and one of, an American was collecting taxes for Al-Qaeda. Al -Qaeda. Y y did your stomach just turn a little bit? That's how, that's the position that Matthew was in. Not only did they collect taxes for the occupying force, but they cheated enough so that they were all very wealthy themselves. They, they charged way over more than they should have. And Jesus chose this guy to be one of his 12. So you and I should be kind of encouraged. <laughs> and Matthew's uh, uh, relating his experiences uh, with Jesus and in this letter, and so we could find our way around the letter. Uh, ages ago, somebody took the letter and they put chapters and verses in it. It wasn't part of the original letter, but that's just so we could find our way around. So we're in chapter 14, that's the big number, little verse, little numbers 22, 14, 22. It says this, it says, Immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. Now let me give you a little bit of context. Jesus has just received the news that his second cousin, John, has been beheaded. Unjustly, unfairly. It was all a political kind of a, kind of a thing, and, it's, and it's, he's been beheaded. And uh, <clears throat> what we know about uh, Jesus and John is that their moms, Elizabeth and Mary, were first cousins, were cousins. <clears throat> we also know that there was a really tight relationship because when Mary got um, pregnant without being married, you know, wasn't, it was as much as it might be frowned on today, uh, it was really frowned on in that day. And so she went off to her cousin, um, uh, or to her mom's cousin, Elizabeth's house, to stay uh, to kind of process this. And I think it was the encouragement that Elizabeth, too, had had a miraculous child that encouraged her to go home and face the crowds. Um, anyhow, so they were really close. It's obvious that Jesus and John were raised uh, with one another. John is also known as John the Baptist. He's the one who baptized Jesus. But it's important to know that John did not know that Jesus was, was like the special Messiah until after he baptized him. John would later tell some people uh, that God told him that when, when the Spirit descended upon this one, then he would know he's the Messiah. And John later tells some people, that's the Lamb of God, and the reason I know is because I saw the Spirit come down. Okay? So some of you might remember that when Jesus initially went to... Uh, uh, John to be baptized. John uh, made a, a really radical claim for that day. He said, I'm not even worthy to uh, tie your sandals. Now, you got to understand, that is like the lowest of the low job. Only a, only a bond servant of the lowest or order would ever touch someone's shoes and feet. Okay? In many cultures today, right, the, the feet are dirty, yucky, and it's the ultimate curse to touch somebody with your feet or to touch their feet. And this is true in Christ's day. And so when John is saying, saying, you should baptize me, I'm not, he's not saying you're a Messiah. He doesn't even know that yet. What he's saying is, Jesus, I've grown up with you. And between the two of us, your life before God is pretty good. He's not declaring him Messiah. He's just saying, of the two of us, your life is right with God, better than mine. So these two have this special relationship. And then Jesus later on goes on to talk about John when he's arrested initially and say, John is, is, is the greatest of the prophets. Have you heard of all these prophets of Moses and whatnot? He's, he's the last of them. He's a great man. So he's just found out he's been killed. A second cousin he grew up with has been killed. A great man of God has been killed. His heart is broken. We know one of the reasons that his heart is broken because what he does is as soon as he hears this news, he gets his disciples in a boat and he tries to you know, go to another part of across this great lake, Sea of Galilee is what we call it, to get away from the crowds. But when he gets to where they're going, the crowds had run around. And when he gets there, it says that Jesus has compassion on them. It's overwhelming. He left to avoid them. But when they're, when they're there, he sees, he, he says they're like sheep without a shepherd. In other words, they need to be led. They, they just want, it, it, it's not, a matter of, he doesn't see them as just draining from them, as, as more and more, gimme, gimme, gimme. What he see that, sees them as is people in need that generally need to experience God. So he takes some time and he says, uh, first of all, it says he heals many. 
And then he says, we should feed them. And the disciples are like, yeah, they should go feed themselves. And Jesus says, no, let's do it. And then they feed with a very little. They feed the entire crowd. That's where we pick up the story. So it's at the end of a very long day. You're following me? The end of this very long day, back to 22, Jesus made the disciples get in the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. So he said, letting the crowd know it's time to go. Okay? After he dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Why? Well, first of all, yes, he was a man of prayer. But he still needs to process the loss of this cousin. When evening came, he was there alone. But the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. What we know is that the Sea of Galilee is kind of like a bowl. And when the winds blow in that area, that, that, that uh, lake or that great sea uh, can get like the ocean. I mean, it just it waves. And it's actually top of boats and whatnot. And so they're struggling to get across. But they're far enough out where you probably you can't see them, you can't get to them. All right? During the fourth watch of the night, it's somewhere between 3 and 6 a.m., uh, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. I guess he decided walking around was too long. <laughs> when the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. Now, now I, I don't know what picture you have in your mind, but a lot of times the movies, it's middle of the day, the water's glassy, Right, because it's hard to do a, a a really good effect with waves, you know, going around. So the water's glassy, you know, and he's got the nice blue sash <laughs> with the perfectly wind going back in his in his hair. Right, you got, and <laughs> hooray for Hollywood. All right, <laughs> that's nothing. We're we're talking night time. There's probably because they can see something. There's probably a moon out. Um, so they can barely see, but there's wind and waves, and it's hard to see. And all of a sudden, you see this figure out on the water, and then when he gets close enough to see that it's a man, you're freaking out. <laughs> Understandably so. And they're afraid. Um, but 27 says, but Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Which, which, and then Peter says, Lord, if it's you, Tell me to come to you on the water, which is interesting. They obviously recognize his voice. They had been around him enough where they recognized his voice. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And when they climbed to the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. Now, as we kind of read through this, it's, it's easy to, um, like I say, just kind of read it as a Bible story and go, yeah, 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 without stopping and kind of thinking about this. Because there's some, um, if you're not raised in the church and you're new to this, you got to go, what? Okay, so like my first question here is going to come up on the sc uh, screen. Wh why would Peter ask such a question in the first place? Or last week what Avery said is, because it, it says this, he got down out of the boat. Why would, he, you know, why would he let go of the boat? I mean, he was dumb enough to get out of the boat, all right? But why would he let go of the boat? And I know you're just like, well, it was Jesus, and of course he would, yada, yada. Come on, let's just stop for a second, okay? They're in this boat. They've been struggling against the waves into the evening now. They're not getting anywhere, right? It's like rush hour traffic in the Bay Area, <laughs> all right? And, and then they have this experience where they think it's a ghost, so their heart's like this, and it's Jesus. And it seems like the first thing that Peter can think of is, hey, Lord, can I come? Am I the only one who goes, goes like, what? <laughs> Doesn't make any sense. Why would he, why would he, why would he ask such a, what would, what would possess Peter to ask such a, Ask such a question. I mean, I can understand if Jesus said, it's me, why don't you come on out? Okay, then I wouldn't have thought of that, but okay, Lord, I guess I will. All right? But why would you initially, it's like, wind, waves, are not going anywhere, it's a ghost, so it's not, it's Jesus. Oh, great, hey, can I come too? <laughs> so, I, you know, it's, we, sometimes we, we read the scriptures, and, and it's easy to just read over something like this, but this is... 
There's some, something significant, obviously, or I wouldn't have anything to talk about today. Um, <laughs> there's something significant that's going on here that's kind of behind the scenes that we could easily miss. And, and what's easy to miss is the context of what it meant for Peter and the others in that boat to be a disciple. Okay? So let me just kind of give a quick review. For so, those of you who've been uh, with us, it's now been, I've now been here two full years. Can you believe that? Two full years. Amen. <laughs> And it was about this time two years ago that we actually taught on this, uh, this idea of discipleship. So let me just do a really quick uh, review. For a, a, a Jewish kid in this day and age, and by the way, this is, it's similar in this day and age, though, though every Jewish uh, uh, child, um, uh, male and female, go through what we now call elementary or early education and then junior high and high school. In their day and age, uh, what we would call early education was called Beit Sefer, S-E-F-E-R, Beit Sefer. And this is where they would study the first five books of the Hebrew Scriptures. They're called the Torah. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And matter of fact, they would memorize most, if not all, of that. And that's where they learn to read and write, but mainly they're learning the law. They're learning the Scriptures. And like I say, boys and girls, most uh, uh, kids would go to the synagogue and they would, they would go through this period. And then around 12 years of age, especially in this day and age, because it's agricultural age, most kids would go back and just, you know, work on the family farm or, or help out with whatever the, the family business happened to be. Usually it was working somebody else's farm because they weren't a whole lot of landowners back, back in, the, in the day. But those who had the money or were or decent at school or whatnot and some, some time would go on to what we, for us might be junior high and high school, but for them it's called Beit Midrash, M-I-D-R-A-S-H, Beit Midrash. Okay, and which means the teaching. It's, it's a time where, you, where for them you would del delve into everything from Joshua, which comes right after Deuteronomy, through Malachi. They would study the rest of the Hebrew scriptures. And again, memorizing large, large portions. And then after that, most of them, actually almost all of them, would then go to their family, family trade. Okay? And remember that after Beit Sefer, um, you were about 12 years old and, you're, and you were becoming an adult at 13. So for girls, you didn't have a chance for Bateman Rash because you were about getting married about that time or you're getting ready to be married. Um, for the guys, you had a little extra, little extra time and so they would fit, uh, finish Bateman Rash and they'd go back and do the family trade or fish or farm or work for somebody else. Uh, but there's no, there no time for formal education. Now, the, the very, very best students um, could actually dream of following a rabbi, being what we call a Talmud, okay? T-A-L-M-I-D, Talmud, T-A-L-M-I-D. Now, a, a, a Talmud is that word that we translate disciple. And there's two kinds of disciples, okay? Everyone in, in the rabbi's town, right, that the rabbi was in essence a disciple. So sometimes in the Bible it says that uh, uh, there were many disciples there, okay? He's talking about the whole crowd, because in essence, a, a disciple is a learner. But then there's the, the disciple, Talmud, who is the one who gets to follow the master. That's the 12. So what they do is, if you, after you're finishing these two, if you were the best of the best, you would go to a rabbi, and you would apply, you would ask to become one of his Talmuds. And what he would do is he would he'd kind of, um, you know, he'd quiz you on your, if you weren't from his, you know, synagogue or whatnot, he would, he would quiz you on the scriptures and kind of get your passion for the word. Um, but there's, there's another step that he would do, and especially since you probably grew up in this community, and that is, is he would evaluate you not based really on what you know, but on your potential. Okay? Because if, if a rabbi invites you to become one of, um, one of his disciples, what he's saying is that I believe in you. He wasn't saying, like, in essence, you apply to grad school today, if they allow you in, they're saying one of two things. Or actually, they're saying two things. First of all, they, they think you could pass. And second of all, uh, they think you could pay the bill. Right? That's, that's in essence of what it means to get into uh, a university. And there, there are some schools, there, there's a third edition in, in that. They think that you'll be successful enough to bring them prestige. Okay? And, and in that case, that's a little bit about what a rabbi would do. Because he, what he would do is... He would be saying that he believed that you had the capacity to know what he knew, but think what he thought, feel like he felt, in, in essence, that you could become like him in thought, word, deed, and character. 
And encompass being more than just learning and memorizing information. Encompass your whole being, body, soul, and spirit. Because there was an expectation that you would become just like the rabbi. So if I said, follow me, and, that, and by the way, that was a traditional way a rabbi would uh, um, call his disciples. He would simply say, he wouldn't say your application is accepted, yada, yada, yada. He would just come to you and say, follow me. And in those two words, what he would be saying is, I believe that you can become like me, that you can know what I know, that you can do what I can do, that you would process the Torah and love God the way that I love God. I mean, it was a huge call. And the expectation is, is that what the rabbi does, you will do. So there is a built-in expectation for all of Jesus' disciples as they're sitting in the boat and it's rocking about and Jesus comes out walking on the water. Now their expectation is, and they've already experienced this, if Jesus heals, the expectation is someday we'll be able to heal. If Jesus casts out demons, then someday we'll be able to cast out demons. And as you know, Jesus, in fact, sends them out to do that very thing. And, and, and it wasn't, I mean, that, now the, the whole healing and, and casting out of demons was a special deal. Most rabbis couldn't do that. No rabbis could do that. But the, but the sending them out to do what you do or teach what you teach, that was, that was common knowledge. So when Peter's on the boat and he sees Jesus out on the water, this is part of the checklist that he's been, you know, every, every time they see Jesus do something, and of course they're just like us, they remember the positive and kind of minimize the, you know, the washing of the feet. Okay, but these are the things I want to do. Healing, oh, the good one, right? Casting out demons, absolutely. Making the Pharisees look like idiots, like that one, right? Um, walking on water, check. I like that one. Can I come out? Let's do it now. See, that was, that, was the, that was his, why would he ask that question? Because it was built into the expectation of a disciple. If the master's doing it, the disciple can do it. That's why he had that thought. And the, and the truth is, is that, is that all of them were thinking about it. Peter's just the type A personality, go get him. He's usually the first one to talk. Sometimes it's good. Sometimes, you know, the foot in the mouth, Right? But I think we have to ask, well, actually, let me, let me just give you one more thing before I kind of move on. For those of you who are new, because uh, you heard Tom talk about it, and you hear, uh, or, or you will hear, at the end of a service a lot of times, I will say, go walk in the dust of the master. And this all comes from the idea that a disciple in that day and age, their job was to follow 20, almost 24-7 their, their rabbi wherever they went. And the roads weren't like they were today. They were, they, even if they were pay with the Roman roads and whatnot. They're still dirty and yucky. And after a day of following your master, if you're behind him, right, all this dust and dung and mud would get kicked up. But in their case, when you walked in, whoever wo walked, because this was, was, this was honorable, right? Whoever got to walk closest to the master was obviously the most honored disciple, and whoever walked further away from the master was less so. So the one who is the dirtiest, if they all walked in, and you want to know who the master thought was his cherished student, just look at the dirtiest one. Because they were the ones that were walking most closely behind the rabbi. So a saying came up in that day and age for the disciple who's walking so closely behind his master that they, they'd say, may you walk in the dust of your master. Because it was a sign that you were imitating and following and, and taking in and favored by the master. So that's that kind of I idea. And, and Peter, in, in the essence of walking the dust of the master, says, all right, can I come? And he gets out of the boat. I'm going to walk on water. And he starts walking on. But then we got to ask the second question. Why did he sink? Why did he sink? Because he, it, it, he's successful. It's not like he let go and he started sinking. It says he started to walk out towards Jesus. Well, what else does it say, though? It says right here. Um... Verse 30, but, so he got out, out of the boat and walked on the water and came toward Jesus. So, success. But, when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and he began to sink, and he cried out, Lord, save me. See, all of a sudden, he's fine when his eyes are on Jesus, but he takes his eyes off of Jesus, and he begins to see, if you would, reality. <laughs> the waves are moving. This isn't glassy water. The waves are moving. Right? 
And he begins to think, how am I going to navigate this next wave? Do I lean into it? Do I, do I, and, and, and then things start happening in his head, which leads to the next thing. When Jesus finally pulls him out, what does Jesus say? Why did you doubt? He took his eye, takes his eyes off of Jesus, and all of a sudden he notices the circumstances. And when he notices the circumstances, it all of a sudden occurs to him, I can't do this. I don't walk on water. And he begins to doubt. Now, here's my question for you. Who does Peter doubt? Now, you can answer this two ways and, and be right both ways, okay? You can, you can answer it, Jesus, okay? And in one way, uh, we're wrong in that, you know, Jesus isn't sinking. So it's not like he, he's doubting that Jesus is powerful enough to do this. Jesus isn't sinking. What Peter does is he looks at the cir circumstances, and what does he doubt? He doubts, well, actually, let's back up the tape. To the very beginning, almost the very beginning. Jesus is amongst the crowds. There's too many people, and he climbs into Peter's boat, and he pushes the boat away, and he teaches from Peter's boat, the crowds. Peter's pretty impressed. This guy's a great teacher. He's obviously a good rabbi. In Peter's mind, he probably should have stopped there because what, Pe what Jesus does next is he says, let's go out a little bit further. Okay, we'll go out a little bit further. He doesn't want to go back. No problem. But then Jesus does a really novice mistake. He says, hey, let's fish. It's the middle of the day. It's hot. They've been fishing all night right in the prime time, in the prime way. Didn't catch a thing. And now this rabbi, who should probably be a rabbi and not a fisherman, says, cast the nets in. So he reminds them of this, you know, kind of backhanded, like, like, you know, we could do this, Jesus, but this really isn't when you're supposed to fish. But he does it out of obedience to the rabbi, and lo and behold, they catch the biggest catch they've ever caught. And when they get on shore, Jesus makes his invitation to Peter. He says to Peter, follow me. Now, now you know what those two words mean. And what is Peter's response? You'll have to go back and read this. Peter's response at that point is, Jesus, I'm a sinner. Translated, you got the wrong guy. <laughs> See, if he was just saying, hey, Peter, come join my school, Peter would have been like, yeah, I'm in. That sounds like fun. Right? But that's not what he's saying. What, what Jesus is saying is, Peter, I believe you see me teach the crowds. I believe you can teach like that. You've seen how I'm powerful. I can... I can I can, I can bend nature itself so you can have this huge catch. You could do that too. And, and Peter's like, uh-uh. Jesus, are you kidding? You, I, I, you must not really know me, Jesus. I'm a sinner. I'm the worst. I'm terrible. You want a, somebody else to follow you. Because I'm a failed student. We know, by the way, he's a failed student because he's fishing. He wouldn't be doing the family trade if he had been accepted by a rabbi. Jesus says, uh-uh, I'm going to make you a fisher of men. Fast forward. <laughs> Peter's out on the water. He begins to see the waves. And he begins to say, you know what? Jesus has got the wrong guy. <laughs> now, I just want to be clear here. Peter did, can't walk on water. So, you know, the, so he's not fully doubting Jesus because Jesus isn't sinking. But he's not fully doubting himself because the truth is he can't walk on water. No matter how hard he tries, he can't walk on water. There's this middle part, though. What he doubts is what Jesus sees for Peter. That's what he doubts. And that is why he sinks. See, I don't know about you, but last week I was really encouraged when Avery said, just let go of the boat. And I thought of several things that, you know, in the new year, I want to, I want to, Allow God to do this for me, and I'm going to trust him. But as I was processing that, I realized that, that kind of like a, a lot of New Year's resolutions, right? Not just the spiritual ones, but whether it's losing weight or controlling your anger or bettering your finances or doing church more or joining a Bible study, whatever. You're, you're going to jump into it, and you have all this energy of this is the year, and I'm going to have faith in God, but what we're really saying is I'm going to try really hard to please God. Okay? And we do what Peter did. Get out of the boat. We go sign up for the membership. We get the book for the class. We you know, take the anger management course, whatever it is. right? But then all of a sudden, in the midst of all that new excitement, you know, you get two, three weeks down the line, you begin to look at reality. 
right? I'm an angry person. I cope with life through eating, drinking, drugs, whatever it may be. I don't have the time. I, and we take our eyes off of Jesus. And we begin to look at the circumstances. And then, it's not just that, though. It's not just that. Then we begin to take a self-evaluation. Wait a second. I've made this resolution every year and failed. This is who I am. This is, my family was an angry family. We're just angry people. Right? And you begin to say, I can't do this. And you start to sink. And you start to sink. I start to sink. When the challenge all of a sudden becomes greater than our ability, we begin to doubt, lose faith. Not just ourselves, but really lose faith in God. Because the truth is, God's pretty clear. You can't do it. No, you can't. Right? That's the, that's the first step to recovery. Right? Believe there's a power greater than yourself that can do it. But you can't. You're powerless. Actually, the second step is to turn it over to that power. But the first step is, I am powerless. And when you slip off of recovery, whether that be, like I say, drug or alcohol or or engaging with God or whatever it would be, it's not, it's not necessarily because all of a sudden you realize that you you're, uh, can't do it or you're power. It, it's you take your eyes off of the one who can. It's, it's you begin to think about what you can do rather than what he said he would do. See, the key to success is faith. Faith that Jesus can do what he said he would do. Not faith in yourself. Because here's the truth, okay? I'm sorry, moms and dads, if you're a teenager or young adult or kid are here. The truth is, you cannot be anything you want to be. No matter how much I want, no matter how much I try, I will never be a forward in the National Basketball Association. Ever. Now, there's certain things that if you're gifted in and you work really hard that can come true for you, it's true. But you cannot do anything that you set your mind to. Human history proved that out. Even, even if you take those who have achieved greatness in music, in politics, if you look at their whole life, you will find a whole series of other things they're terrible at. That they just can't control. Our faith needs to be that in what Jesus said he would do in and through us, not that I believe that I can do it myself with, God, with a little extra nudge from God. See, it's not about my effort or your effort, but about God's power. And that power flows when we believe Jesus, when we believe what God says about us is true, even when the circumstances says you're an idiot for believing it. That's faith. Believing in what's evident ain't true. It's about fundamentally our identity, which is what we're going to spend the next few weeks about talking about. We're going to talk about our identity in Christ, getting clear on what exactly is Jesus' view of who we are. Believing, I really believe that if we get our eyes on that, not just on our potential, this isn't the power of positive thinking, okay? The power of positive thinking does a lot, but it will not ultimately transform a soul, okay? As a matter of fact, one of the things, the first things you learn in any kind of recovery, anyone who's addictions, for the first thing you learn is that you don't lack willpower. As a matter of fact, your problem is you have too much willpower because you're able to cope. It's not an issue of willpower. It's not an issue of, of, of white knuckling it. That's where Christ comes in. And we begin to look at our identity through him. So we're going we're gonna to spend some time in, in, uh, in 1 Peter, specifically in this series, chapter uh, uh, 1 through uh, 210, chapter 2, verse 10. And I want to just start with just the first, I want to just give, kind of give you a taste of this. So if you open your Bibles, turn your Bibles now to 1 Peter chapter 1. We're not going to spend a whole lot of time here, okay? But I just want to kind of give you an introduction. It's page 857, by the way, if you have one of our Bibles, page 857, 1 Peter 
chapter 1. 1 Peter being the first letter that Peter wrote. This is the Peter. And, and, and like I say, um, Avery did a great job to kind of introduce you to Peter, his successes and his failures and who he was. And if you didn't get a chance to hear that, you can go back and listen to that message. So I'm going to kind of skip and go right into the text here. It says in 1 Peter chapter 1, it says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. So it tells us who it's from. It's from this disciple, uh, Peter. He identifies himself as apostle. Not just the 12 disciples were apostles, but there were, there were special uh, uh, folks that God had ordained to establish new works uh, of his throughout the region. And it was more than just discipling people. It was establishing a new, uh, new work, it seems, and they were called apostles. And it applied to the disciples, or it applied to Paul, and there were some other folks that did this as well. But Peter, an apostle, and notice this is of Jesus Christ. And remember, Christ isn't his last name. It's a title. It's like, it's like a, a Barack Obama president. It's his title. Christ is his title, meaning Messiah, anointed one, hero, if you would. Jesus is that promised Messiah. Now, it's to God's elect strangers in the world scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cadocia, Asia, and, Bith and Bithynia. Now, um, this, these uh, are regions. If you kind of remember the map when we went over this, uh, a little, uh, the book of Acts, remember Antioch, let me turn. Antioch was, you have Jerusalem here, and at the very top where the Mediterranean Sea is, you have Antioch. And if you went around to the other side, um, over here was Ephesus, remember that? And some of you are like, I, I have no idea what he's talking about. Just, just shake your head. <laughs> Anyhow, um, that whole region there, it, he just talked about the, if you would, kind of like counties. That whole region between Antioch and Ephesus is, is who he's writing to. But notice how he identifies them. This is written to what? The elect. Or also, know, or also translated the chosen. Now, he's written, Peter is known as the uh, uh, apostle to the Jews. Okay? Now, he also ministered to the Gentiles, but primarily to the Jews. Paul ministered primarily to Gentiles, meaning just, Gentiles just means non-Jews. Okay? But he did the Jews as well. So they did both. But his primary audience is to the Jews who had left Jerusalem and now are scattered abroad. And, and his initial uh, title here, to God's elect strangers in the world, their first thought would have been, yeah, God's people, the Jews, are God's elect. Okay? That's what they would have thought. We are God's special chosen people because what God did is he looked at all the nations of the world. And out of all the nations of the world, he picked this one to be a special favored people. And if you have any inclination that God chose you because you're something and all that, just look at the nation of Israel in the Bible and you will see it sure isn't on their merit and effort that he chose them. Matter of fact, the, you can pretty much sum the Jewish people up in stiff-necked, stubborn people who pretty much will get it wrong. Okay? And I, I have that blood in me, so that gives you a little insight in my own life. Right? <laughs> but but that amongst all that, God shows them. And that's, and that's part of, of, the, of the great natures that God has chosen you. Because then he goes on, he says, um, God's elect who, first have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. That's that idea that before time began, as God was looking down the annals of time, He chose you, He chose me to be one of His special people. And not only that, it says God the Father to be one of His kids. I mean, you should, you should walk around with a little bit of a chip on your shoulder. Not, not overly prideful, but you're in the, you are in a special adopted child out of everyone in the world of all time. God chose you to be one of his adopted kids. Most people don't get adopted at all, let alone adopted by God. If that's not enough, he says, you've also been elected or called, what? Through the sanctifying work of the Spirit. That whole idea of sanctifying is... Is being, is being made holy or other. Or, in other words, you have a special family identity, right? People should be able to, to look at you and go, oh, that is a king, and I'm talking about the king's kid. That is one of God's kids. Because they got that special, special mark, that, that thing uh, about them. 
right? I'm, I'm, uh, my wife and I are watching a show called, um, um, I think it's called The Farm Kings, because it's a king family that farms, okay? And, and, and they're doing it the old-fashioned way. I mean, they're out at, at sunrise all the way to sundown, and um, they interviewed the football coach. And they, they have nine boys and one girl. All nine boys have played football. Right, the last two are on the football team, and the coach is just talking about, about the king kids and how great it is because you know when, you, when the king kids show up, everybody else has been playing video games and sitting around watching TV all summer. The king kids, you know, they got six packs. They've been hauling hay out in the fields. They're in shape. Now that they have a work ethic. So when he says run 20 laps, everybody else is like, 20 laps. And the king kids are like, oh, 20 laps, yeah, right? And there's a mark about them. They're, they're part of this king farming family. You know they're king kids by their work ethic and by how well in shape they are. And in essence, he's saying, you know what? You, this is part of your identity. You know that spirit of God that has done all those miracles over all time? You know the spirit of God that worked through Jesus that healed people and cast out demons that walked on water? The spirit of God that raised Jesus from the dead is in you. Now, I'm glad you said amen, but let's face it. For most of us, and I mean us, me, me, when I hear that, my initial reaction is, I can walk on water. And then I stop and go, wait a second, let's look at reality here. That doesn't feel like it's true. There's so much in my life, there's not a whole lot of power, and I sink, and I sink, and I sink, and I sink. Why? Because I'm looking at my reality. And the third thing here is for obedience to Jesus Christ and sprinkled by his blood. In other words, we have a purpose. We have a special calling. And just like the disciples of that day and age, when you were called, you were called to be transformed in his image. Part of your unique identity, part of my unique identity is that we have a purpose. And the purpose is to be like Christ. It's a special calling. That's your calling. Not the preacher's calling. Not the elder's calling. Your calling. And here's the other thing, though. Notice these are linked by an and, and they are linked in the, in the Greek as well. Not only do you have a special calling by obedience, but you're sprinkled by his blood. In other words, all that gap between where you should be and where you are is covered, so you're unconditionally loved. It doesn't depend on your merit alone. It's part of your identity. And I know... No, he ends with grace and peace be yours. In other words, grace that God loves you just the way you are, peace in that you presently stand in favor with God. Nothing stands between you. And he wants you to experience that in its fullest measure. In other words, he wants you to realize your full identity and what Christ has for you. Now the, the worship team's going to come up and they're going to play a song. And the reason I want to end with this is because I know you like me... Um, this is great to hear. It's great truth. Thank you, Lord. I, I, I get it. I understand. I believe. But, see, see the but? And, and if you're human, which I think most of you are, uh, if it hasn't come into your head yet, it will. And I just want you to reflect. Not on your past, not on your ability, not on your spirituality or how much of the Bible you know or whether or not you even got most of what I just said. I just want you to reflect on the power of God and what he has said he will do in you and see what he does. Listen to this. <laughs> 